Can I welcome everyone to the third meeting in 2020 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The first item of business is to propose that we take item five in private. Do we agree to do that? Okay. Agenda item two, um, we've got before us Fergus Ewing, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy to give evidence on the Agriculture Retained EU Law and Data Scotland Bill. Uh, Mr Ewing is accompanied today by four Scottish Government officials, John Kerr, Head of Agriculture Policy Division, uh, George Burgess, Deputy Director of Food and Drink, David McLennan, Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and John Brownlee, who's the Bill Team member. Um, can I welcome you all to the meeting? Um, Cabinet Secretary, I understand you want to make a few opening remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Convener. Okay. Good morning, um, everybody. I, I'd like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to provide evidence on the Agriculture Retained EU Law and Data Scotland Bill. Last week, I gave extensive evidence to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee regarding the principles behind the bill and how the Scottish Government intends to use the powers it, it contains. Part one of the bill is set in the context of the UK's decision to leave the European Union, uh, a decision I, I might add that the people of Scotland have consistently opposed. Um, but our duty as a responsible government is to prepare to take the necessary powers to continue to support farmers, crofters and land managers. In brief, this part of the bill uh, will provide stability and certainty for Scottish farmers during a transitional period of around five years after Brexit. The Scottish Government intends to use the powers in this part of the bill to first provide stability to farmers and crofters by ensuring that the common agricultural policy can continue after 2020. Second, to make simplifications and improvements to the CAP for the benefit of Scotland's farmers and crofters. And third, to allow marketing standards and carcass classification rules to be adapted as may be necessary following EU exit. The powers in part two will provide an updated legal mechanism for collection and processing of agricultural data. Such data is a key tool for understanding and responding to the needs of Scotland's farmers and crofters. They will also ensure that there's a clear link to the principles of the GDPR and Data Protection Act 218. I understand the committee wrote to my officials on 10th December with various questions relating to the delegated powers and it seeks further clar clarification regarding some of the answers provided by officials in their reply of the 19th of December. So, I and I suspect largely my officials uh, will provide the committee with uh, such clarification as convener you and your members require. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Um, this will be a, a slightly different session to the one you had uh, last week. Um, we're not uh, driven by policy uh, on this committee. Of course. Uh, uh, it's far more technical than that. Um, so, uh, obviously, feel free to chat to your officials if you need to. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I, I want to ask you about sections 2.1 and 6.1. So section 2.1 is the power to simplify or improve CAP legislation and, and 6 um, is the power to simplify or improve CAP legislation on aid for fruit and vegetable producer organisations. Um, now the government, Scottish Government, said it doesn't intend to use the powers in those sections after 2024. Um, but there's no time limit on the bill on the exercise of these powers. Um, the government stated that putting a time limit in the bill would not allow flexibility required. But can I just ask, is, is there a length of time that you think would be acceptable? Um, well, well, thank you for the, 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 the question and I'd like to make some remarks and then uh, if the officials feel that I have failed to address the question entirely then I'd like them to chip in but I'll start off if I may. First of all I think it's very important to note that in terms of uh, section, sections 3 and 6 um, uh, I really constrain I think ministerial powers quite deliberately in a way that uh, is set out by the wording of the sections so if we look at section Two, subsection 2 and also section 6 subsection 2 then 
we will see that it states that Scottish ministers may only make modifications uh, that they consider would simplify or improve the operation of the provisions of the legislation. So there's a difference, convener, between uh, the meaning of, um, of the clause, had it simply stopped after simplify or improve. If it had simply said the ministers may simplify or improve the legislation, that would have been a fairly broad power. I would contend that the wording here, which is quite deliberate, it constrains the power only to those circumstances where that simplification or improvement will improve the operation of the provisions of the legislation. Now, why is that important? Uh, because it's important, I think, to reflect, as, as, as I would invite the committee to so to do, that this is essentially an adjective rather than a substantive power that allows us to deal with the process and improve it. Um, the common agricultural policy is fiendishly complicated. The administration of it more so, <coughs> more so. We know that farmers and crofters suffered delays to payments back three years ago. That, I hope, is now substantially fixed. Were we to have to go to get primary legislation powers to deal with matters relating to the operation of, uh, uh, of the processes, then we would really run the risk of a very serious risk of not being able to pay out farmers and crofters. Uh, that's why it's essential, in my view, that we continue to have these powers. Now, specifically, your convening your question was about any time limit. I don't believe a time limit is appropriate at all. In fact, quite the opposite. I think it's essential that we do not put ourselves in the position that uh, ministers have to go back to, make primary to seek primary legislation. We know how congested the, the schedule is for primary legislation, uh, uh, and it would not be appropriate or necessary, in my view. Any suggestion that the, the, the power would be time-limited, I think, came from the fact that our document, Stability and Simplicity, which was set out a policy was, which was published in June 2017, envisaged that Brexit would really have been a much further advanced stage by this time. It's not, of course, uh, and a, frankly, the uncertainties a, remain regarding trade and tariffs particularly. Uh, where tariffs imposed, we may well have to make very rapid changes to the nature of subsidies to compensate for additional taxes, which may decimate, for example, the sheep sector. Where trade measures not to prevent a flood of cheap imports of beef equally convener, we may have to act very quickly to support coupling payments by increasing them. Were we to have to go back to Parliament for primary legislation powers, that would mean that our hands would be totally tied. If we have given you the impression that this power would be appropriately reach at, uh, an end at some point, that perhaps is a fault on our part, which I, I, I accept. Uh, I do not believe that it would be sensible or prudent to impose a time-limiting power on this at all. Um, the last thing I would say is, of course, we are always subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, last week, I think I appeared for uh, uh, 90 minutes before... No, I didn't, actually. It was two and a half hours yeah. before REC. You know, that's quite a session of being accountable. I'm not complaining, incidentally. But, you know, two and a half hours before a committee, well, it's accountability, is it not? And quite rightly, Parliament is always able to hold me and has to account for, you know, hundreds of hours, and rightly so, both in committee and in plenary session. So, um, uh, so I, I wanted to, to make it absolutely clear that from a policy point of view, I think any move to constrain powers would be one which may well have <coughs> unintended consequences and from the point of view of farmers and crofters, very potentially deleterious consequences indeed. Now, I don't know if, uh, if uh, officials want to add anything of a technical nature because 20 years ago I was actually a member of, of uh, the precursor of this committee, the sub -ledge committee, and I know that you're concerned really with process convener, not substance, but uh, I, I don't know if I've answered any points. It's just a uh, point of clarity that the simplification task force is 218. 218, sorry. Yes, right. So your view, your view is there should be absolutely no time constraint on these powers. You should just have them forever. Well, ministers need to be able to act swiftly. I mean, the idea that, that ministers will not need to act at, at, at the occurrence of a certain date as a general proposition, convener, seems to me to be for the birds. Um, ministers require to be able to act to do our job and to do our job recognising the mandate that we have but the scrutiny of Parliament, to which, as I say, we are happy to be 
subject to at all times. Uh, but if ministers are hamstrung by you know, having to go back to Parliament unnecessarily, we're not doing ourselves, in my respectful view, any favours at all. And that's been my experience as a minister for 13 years. And I, I don't think it's any disrespect or any diminution or dilution of the ability of Parliament to, uh, to hold us to account Plainly, a, 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 that, that happens all the time, and that's absolutely welcome, and rightly so, and part of the democratic process. But the proposition that um, you know, ministers need to stop doing something and must stop doing something at some future date seems to me to be uh, a very weak and thin premise. Okay. You once again, Mary? Yeah. Yes. Yes? Right. I'm grateful, um, convener. Just to follow up on the point that you've made, the, the government have stated that it does not intend to use the powers in section 21 and 61 after 2024. Is that still your intention? Well, I, I don't have any current intention to do so, but I cannot eliminate the possibility that such an eventuality would arise. That's the, that that is is my view. Okay, but, but because I am slightly puzzled, um, cabinet secretary, if you say that you don't intend using the powers after 2024, why there is no provision for a sunset clause? I don't believe there should be a provision for a sunset clause. There should not be a provision for a sunset clause. Uh, and if, if, in my view, there is a sunset clause, then it, it, may, it may potentially be damaging, because we do not know what, what the future timetable of full implementation of the Brexit will be. We, we are unable to, to say that. Um, and there are some suggestions from some quarters that it may take rather longer than 224 fully to implement changes post Brexit, for example, if you want to see a, a specific the National Audit Office critique of the ELM proposals of the UK government, published, I think, uh, in the summer of last year, set out very clearly that uh, some matters may take 10 years fully to adjust, uh, particularly a, the, a addressing the vital matters relating to climate change. We need to get on with things now, but fully to embed a brand new system, that's the point, take uh, an unspecified length of time. Uh, so, you know, I, I do pre fully appreciate the point mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're making. I don't intend to use the powers, no, but the possibility may arise where I or my successor may require to use those powers. And the point I'm making is that were we unable to do so because we had to go back to primary legislation, that would be a problem. There's another, there's another factor here. Let's say a future administration took a different view about climate change to this administration. Let's say it was opposed to to either dealing with climate change or dragging its feet. It could use the fact that we didn't have the powers to act quickly to drag its feet and then postpone the, the implementation of a primary legislation to tackle what might we would regard in this administration as a lacuna. So, um, you know, beware of what one wish, wishes for is sometimes a useful maxim. OK, okay thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you've, you've mentioned this phrase, which is in uh, 212, um, that ministers would only make modifications that they consider would simplify or improve the operation of the provisions of the legislation. Um, now, in your response to a question from this committee, you said you would only use this power to make modest, quotes, changes, which are predominantly minor in nature. But if you contrast that with a statement on page one of the policy memorandum uh, that this bill is intended to provide Scottish ministers with regulation making powers to amend or replace the cap elements of retained EU law in Scotland, that sounds much wider. So can you just clear up what, 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 it is, your, what is your intention here? Well, our intention is, as it's set out in sections two and section six, is that we, we have power to make modifications which we consider would simplify or improve the operation of the provisions of the legislation. Um, I mean, I suppose it's a value judgment convener as to whether one would characterise such changes as modest or immodest or, or, or wide or narrow. I mean, I think that's a matter of judgment. You know, I'm focusing really what's in the bill. I know that that's the yeah, remit yeah. of this committee. What's in the bill is, is I think, pretty clear, and it does seem to me, although you know we, we're absolutely ready to hear any recommendations this committee and REC may have, but it does seem to me that the, the, the wording is, is particularly felicitous, in that it 
defines uh, to a reasonably clear extent the nature of the powers and why they're, they're sought. And if I could put this in context, the evidence I gave last week to REC at some length, as I've stated on, on this particular point as well as everything else, referred to the publication of a report on um, a, in fact, I have it here, I'm directed the report on the Simplification Task Force. So if the, member is if the committee is interested in the sort of measures that, that we might be implementing in order to simplify uh, the operation of the process, then they are actually set out in convener in this document. And therefore, I think that might give members a clear idea of some of the measures that are proposed. For example, just in, in no particular order of importance, improving mapping, mapping stability during the SAF window, proportionate approaches to penalties, inspections charter, standardisation of capital grant rates, improving appeals processing performance, improving communications to customers about scheme application so that there's less risk that they're non-compliant. I've just swiftly gone through those. I'm sorry, I don't mean any disrespect. I, each of them covers a, lot, a large area of technicalities. I mean, I spent every Wednesday, barring holidays, and uh, uh, a, 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 in the last three years, uh, more or less, speaking to officials about these technicalities. Mm. We need to be able to act quickly. If we can't, then we risk that farmers and crofters do not get the money to which they're entitled, and Parliament wishes them to get. So I see, I see. I just explaining. I hope for the benefit of the committee, you know how I, I see this operating. That I see us taking forward the work of this um, this report uh, as we go through the the period ahead um, to simplify the operation of the process of the CAP schemes. Well, sim simplifying processes is always a good thing. Um, but what, I, I'm still not really clear on whether you intend to use this power just well, to make I have minor, no intention. Min, oh, hang on, you haven't heard the question. I apologise. Um, to, to make only minor changes mm. rather than major changes. And I accept that's a value judgment. Um, I'm well, not I, clear I what I've, you're saying on this. Well, I think I've, I've answered it by reference to stating what's in, in the bill. Um, but I don't know if officials want to add anything about this. John. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. The, I, I guess the key point here is that we have um, got the powers to simplify and improve the legislation insofar as it relates to, and in the, the, what Mr Ewing said, um, would improve the operation and provisions in the legislation. So <clears throat> it's our intention to be able to bring in the sorts of improvements Mr Ewing is talking about using the powers within this bill. So although they're re reasonably broad in scope in terms of the numbers of different um, applicants that apply for the sorts of subsidies, that's the, the types of changes that we envisage making are within the context of something that everybody will still recognise as being um, a support payment to farmers and crofters and one or two other land managers in Scotland that are also um, subject to some of the support that we give, for example, um, forestry planting grants. So we need to be in a position to be able to make the necessary changes to continue to have current schemes that operate well, like, for example, to increase how many trees we might plant, would be an example of something that we might do that would be uh, within the current framework of the existing support structure. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll move on to a, another area of questioning. Um, Mary. Thank you, um, convener. Um, my question follows on from the questions that the convener has asked because my um, main area of, of concern is, is very similar to um, the questions that have been asked around the sunset clause and the, the, the breadth of the, of the powers. Um, and, and I accept that the explanation you have given um, and, and it is based on your intention of how you would adapt and use um, the, the, the legislation. But I suppose um, my concern is that um, given that there is no time limit on the power and the powers within the, the bill are fairly broad, a future government, and, and if I come back to the point that you made, that it's a value judgment, um, and they are broad in scope. A future government, is there a potential risk that they could use the powers in this bill to make substantial changes? And is there any way that you could prevent that happening? Well, I appreciate the concern that 
Parliament and stakeholders have shown regarding the perceived breadth of, of this power. And I, you know, I don't take that concern lightly. I understand <laughs> this is one of the functions of, mm -hmm. of this committee seriously to consider. Um, uh, and we will consider, obviously, the comments the committee makes as the bill progresses to stage two. Um, the, the drafting of a bill is a long process. Several teams of policy and legal officials have spent a long time carefully considering, considering and you know, deliberating on how the bill might be formed best to achieve its purpose. And a lot of thought has been given to the delivery of the policy intention as set out in Stability and Simplicity, mm -hmm. this, this document to which I, I referred um, earlier through secondary regis legislation, as well as maintaining sufficient flexibility to address unforeseen challenges inherent in, in this kind of ever-changing mm. Brexit processes. Nobody here, I, I imagine, is sure what's going to happen regarding trade mm. and tariffs on on Brexit. So, mm -hmm. ergo, we do yeah. really need flexibility, and any successor of mine would would have to have that flexibility. So, um, you know, I just make make again the, the the point. We will we will consider very carefully any um, any measures that uh, the, the, any committee suggests we should consider at stage two, obviously, mm. as part of the process of any mm. bill. But I think this is a, there's a sort of fundamental principle involved here that, you know, one, we need to be able to act swiftly, um, uh, particularly in relation to the administration of payment schemes mm. and support schemes, to correct things very quickly. Primary legislation requirement would prevent us doing that. But, you know, we are absolutely accountable mm. to to Parliament, to, to a greater extent, convener, than appears to operate in Westminster in relation to the, mm. the, the counterpart work of scrutiny of subordinate legislation, as I understand it. Mm. But because my concern lies, there's almost a contradiction when the, the, the policy documents say that this legislation would be used, or these clauses would be used to make changes that are predominantly minor in nature and modest changes, but the width is quite broad. And I wonder if there is any way um, to almost future-proof this, so that if, you, if any changes being made were more than minor or modest, that some kind of checks and balances could be put in place, some form of consultation or something in the bill to make sure that something might, may, major could not be put through under this legislation? Well, I, th I think, above all, it's important that we shouldn't bind the hands of a, a future government in this way, and the, the power has been drawn in such a way as to ensure it is not a carte blanche by reference to the phrase of the operation of the process, to which I've, I began by, by specifically um, mentioning and, and indeed stressing. So it's not an unconstrained power anyway, um, but it's not so restrictive that it would prevent a, a future government from using the power effectively. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Stuart. Uh, thank you. Um, once again, it's on section 2.1, and it's the, the appropriate procedure uh, for the, that particular power. Uh, you, you spoke earlier on, Cabinet Secretary, that uh, you spoke to the REC committee last week, and, uh, and that an example of how the power that could be used would be to liberalise the penalties regime, uh, to make the system more proportionate. Uh, do you consider, therefore, that, the, that this matter might, uh, might be more appropriately scrutinised uh, by Parliament under the affirmative procedure? I think I'll maybe ask my officials to. It's a sort of legal question, largely. So I wonder if Mr. McClellan might be permitted to answer this question. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think, from a, a legal perspective specifically, I would just start by saying a lot of the exercise of the, this power is likely to be highly technical in nature. It's a power that allows us to, or we'd allow the, the ministers to modify the the cap legislation as it is defined in the in the bill and a lot of the the simplification improvements are likely to be simplifying and improving how that legislation works as legislation as opposed to uh, things which will have a, a massive effect on the ground um, like as a, anybody who has read any of the cap legislation will be aware it is it is very complicated and it is difficult to read. And exercising these powers to simplify how the how it works as legislation um, would be a would be a simplification and improvement. And having having said that, the 
the fact that there wouldn't be necessarily an on-the-ground effect of that change we think wouldn't merit the, uh, the, the higher level of procedure. I don't know if, if John would like to add to that. So, so that, that, that's exactly the um, advice that was taken um, from legal colleagues when we were thinking about which powers are... Um, what level of scrutiny is appropriate for the sorts of things that we would seek to do. And uh, as David has set out, there's quite a lot of technical things that we could improve in the way that the, the schemes are, are run from a housekeeping perspective that wouldn't necessarily be of um, very significant value from a stakeholder point of view to engage with that. And from a procedural point of view, we might not want to tie up time uh, with the... the uh, the additional requirements that would be a, a, a afforded to an affirmative procedure when there isn't the merit <coughs> to do that. Okay, so, um, uh, so obviously with the, the additional requirements that the affirmative procedure actually brings, um, could you f foresee then that would actually have a, a negative effect uh, in terms of the delivery uh, of policy? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, because it would potentially introduce um, significant time um, built into the process uh, and it potentially be constraining um, in terms of the way that the process might work. Right. Okay. Uh, and just for the clarification, uh, so in, in terms of this uh, power again, um, uh, I think you mentioned there that this is just it's about the procedural elements. So this, isn't, this wouldn't uh, affect major policy changes. Is that correct? So it's not the intention to bring about significant policy changes within this bill. That would be a matter for future legislation. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. I, I don't think it's major policy changes because if you just go back to the words I read out, it okay. says that the simplification improvement refers to the operation of the process. So it's constrained by the meaning of those words. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the next question just is regarding, uh, once again, the Section 2.1 and Section 3.1 of the Bill, and it's the, the issue regarding the, the reporting periodically to Parliament. Uh, certainly, in response to the written questions that the Committee has sent to the Cabinet Section to the Government uh, on the powers of the, these two sections of the Bill, and it was indicated that the Scottish Government uh, would reflect on how best to keep the Parliament informed uh, on the use of these powers. And the Cabinet Secretary, have you reflected any further on how best to keep the Parliament informed? Um, I've been doing a few other things since, since then, so I have to admit that, to be quite candid, I haven't spent any time reflecting on that particular thing. However, I mean, I think, you know, with respect, as I understand it, the role of the Parliamentary Committees is to consider whether there should be any reporting matter. And I fully expect to... Ms. McMillan, that these matters w w are likely to be brought forward in, in amendments, even probing amendments at stage two, when that would, I think, perhaps give a fuller you know, opportunity. Um, in general terms, I hope that I, I'm correct in saying that I have sought to and have in practice kept the Rural Committee informed about matters of importance affecting the rural economy. And periodically, for example, we report to them as to how the, the CAP payment system is operating because of the high controversy that that engendered three years ago prior to our largely having fixed these problems. So, you know, I think as a track record convener, I, I hope it's relevant for me to point out, and obviously you can check with the clerks of the REC, that, you know, we do in practice try to, to be proactive in informing Parliament and reporting to Parliament. Um, I'll just make one further point. If Acts of Parliament uh, contain numerous um, sort of ad hoc, random measures, one might say, about reporting to Parliament, then future ministers may say that in the absence of a statutory duty, they shouldn't report to committees. That could be abused by a, a government that doesn't want to report to Parliament. Uh, because there's no duty to report on a particular matter. I think that would be a kind of unfortunate hodgepodge situation because, you know, my duty is to tell Parliament matters of importance. And if there are, if there are difficulties for us, that, that's too bad. I have to, to report every month, I think, about the performance of the, um, the payment to farmers of the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments. 
Uh, if there are difficulties that that causes me, that's too bad for me. I have to face the music. Fortunately, the music has been particularly harmonious and uh, 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 over the last year or so, from my point of view. But um, you know, I, I really think we shouldn't try to, to, to hamstring ministers uh, because it may have the opposite effect for, of which Parliament intends. But just let me kind of emphasise the point that you know I take the view that we should take a proactive view to report information to committees, and that will, approach will apply to any exercise of this power powers uh, as as well. Uh, and uh, therefore, I'm very open to listening carefully to specific arguments that may be advanced at stage two, should this be something that any member wishes to pursue. So is that, is that something you're, 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 you're open to it? Um, is what you're well, I, I don't think in this case it's actually necessary, and I think there are risks involved. Um, I think I probably would be of, of the view that, um, a, in fact, just let me rephrase that. Uh, on the first occasion I exercise these powers, I, I intend to not just report to Parliament, but to, to uh, almost certainly to advise the REC in advance that we're right. thinking of doing that. I think in the, the early occasions of exercising any new power, that would be a sensible approach to take. That's what I would do as, as a minister. Yeah. I appreciate that's perhaps not the role of this committee, which is to, to set out a legal framework and to scrutinise the that's ministerial correct. use of power. Um, a, but. You know, I'm not sure that a specific statutory duty, for the reasons I've tried to set out, would actually be sensible, because it then begs the question of, in what circumstances are there no statutory duties upon ministers? And could that be something that, you know, could be taken advantage of in ways that perhaps may not be in the mind of any member in this committee? Well, the other argument is, um, you know, whoever takes over from you might, might not be uh, as open and transparent as you are, and they may take a an entirely different approach it might not be uh, as accommodating with committees. So getting something in legislation I could, think actually, in could actually help. Uh, you know, REC will routinely ask us to provide information at once, and there has to be a, sell a, a, a reasonable kind of facility in the free engagement in this matter and practice. That's how it, how it works. Um, and, of course, Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise any use of these powers in sections two and three of the bill, where secondary legislation is, is laid before it, so so there wouldn't be a vacuum. There would be um, for any secondary legislation under the negative procedure as well as the affirmative, the opportunity for Parliament rightly to <coughs> scrutinise. But equally, I know that committees don't want to overburden themselves with affirmative procedures because you know you have prioritisation for your workloads and. Every committee, as I understand it, is already fairly busy. So there has to be, I think, an element of proportionality and judgment applied uh, here. But, but you know, we will listen carefully to, to any views that are put forward at stage two. OK. All right. Tom, have you got a question? Yeah, thank you, convener, and good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my question relates to Section 8. Um, on max, uh, marketing standards, specifically the penalties um, for breach of mar um, marketing standards. The maximum penalties are set out in section 20, subsection 4, which I think is um, imprisonment um, up to five years on indictment and 12 months on summary conviction. But my understanding is that the policy intent would be for a much more lenient approach commensurate with existing provisions for um, breach of marketing standards, which understands that a level five fine of about £5,000. Uh, my question would be then, is there a need to specify on the face of the bill that for breaches of marketing standards, um, the maximum <coughs> penalties would be reduced and would not be, for example, a possibility of imprisonment for five years? Um, I, I I think Mr Burgess is keen to, to answer this one. Okay, certainly. Um, we gave a number of examples in our letter of the existing marketing yeah. standards regulations and of the penalties that are imposed there. And as you say, the, the maximum penalty that is in practice allowed by those regulations is a level five fine on, on summary uh, conviction. It would be entirely possible, uh, as you suggest, to amend uh, the, the section of the bill, section 20, that, mm -hmm. that provides a general power to, mm -hmm. to create uh, uh, 
penalties uh, for, for offences so as to constrain it in relation to marketing standards. So that's, that's entirely possible, uh, and we will, as we said in the letter, consider that. However, if we look at the existing marketing standards regulations which have set these offences with the level 5 fine, those were made under the European Communities Act 1972. Now, that act itself allows for the possible you know, maxima of up to two years' imprisonment or, indeed, an unlimited fine on conviction on indictment and uh, level five fine on summary conviction. So the existing practice within the, f the freedom provided by the 1972 Act has been in relation to marketing standards to set a, a, a much lower uh, level uh, of, of the sort that we outlined in our letter. So I think the existing practice would show that while powers in primary legislation might allow a higher maximum to be set in regulations in practice, that, that hasn't been done. So I think the, 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 the short answer to your question is it could be done, but there isn't a need to uh, refine the, 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 the bill in, in the way that you're suggesting. Okay. In a section, I think it's in subsection 5, it states that regulations um, before uh, there's a need to uh, consult with a, a representative person, with specifically referring to um, the use of the regulations to make um, offences and set penalties. Uh, can you perhaps say what the nature of that consultation and engagement would be? Um, well, the, what we've included in Section 8.5 is a statutory requirement for the Scottish mm -hmm. Ministers to uh, consult, and that is with persons as they consider a representative of the interests of persons likely to be affected, so producers, processors, other parts of the industry, and, and potentially consumer groups as, as well. Um, probably helpful to understand the context that in... Yeah. A lot of these areas, the marketing standards, are not just a creation of, of ministers or indeed of the European Commission, but are actually reflecting internationally agreed marketing standards. So the UN Economic Commission on Europe, UNICHI, is very active, particularly in the field of fruit and veg. So you know, a lot of the, the hard work is done at a, at a sort of... Um, international level. So there is actually relatively little flexibility when it comes down to what is what is done by at the moment the Commission and in future by by by, by ministers. So the the, the the extent of flexibility to maintain alignment with international um, standards is actually rather narrower than the, the than the powers that are here might might at first sight uh, suggest. So Yes, you know, if, if there were to be changes, perhaps to reflect changes at an international level, there would be consultation with those that are that are affected, uh, and part of that consultation could well cover the um, enforcement uh, powers, including any any offences and penalties. It's probably worth just to, to to add that we've we've checked back recent records and can find no record in the last at least five years of any prosecution having been taken under any of the, the marketing standards provisions. So while it's absolutely right that the committee considers the, the offence provisions, it is perhaps a slightly academic issue. OK, thank you. So if that's the case, there's been no prosecutions, um, why, why do we still need to retain this uh, rather high maximum penalty? I think like a lot of offences in a sort of regulatory environment like this, the, the principal purpose is, is a deterrent effect. So you know, we're, we're not out to catch lots of people for, for committing an offence and you know, hit them with a, a very high fine. Rather, it is the deterrent effect of having that offence in place, which makes it quite clear that a particular uh, action or, or, in some cases, inaction is, is not appropriate. And that as we can see from, from practice, is effective in, in, in preventing um, people failing to follow the, the marketing standards. So it's a deterrent rather than it, something that you, yes. you, you think would be used. The yes. fact it's there prevents people committing offences. That's, that's is, certainly is the evidence of, of, the, of, of, of the last um, at least five years that we've checked the records for. Right. OK. Is that you, Tom? Yeah. OK. Um, Bill, have you got a question? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, sticking with the marketing standards and the, the procedures, 
I think you've acknowledged that um, Section 8.1 of the Bill could allow radical changes to be made to marketing standards and also enables the creation of offences. Could you expand on why the affirmative procedure is not considered to be more appropriate? Sorry, I'm uh, presumptuous. Um, in my last answer outlining the extent to which while the powers may appear broad, in fact, you know, if we are looking to maintain consistency, consistency within the UK, consistency internationally, the the room for manoeuvre is is actually much much more limited than 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 might at first seem, and that in practice, a lot of these standards are are developed at at an international level. So, while in theory the power could be used to make radical changes, in practice, uh, common sense dictates that the changes will be will be rather more limited. Now, what we have done in this clause, and you might wish to compare it with the, the UK Agriculture uh, Bill, we have included the, the requirement for uh, consultation with um, those that are uh, likely to be affected by uh, any, any changes to the, to the marketing standards, something that is not present in, in, in the, UK, the UK Bill. So we see that as making sure that the people that are really interested in the subject need to be involved, have the chance to, to be involved and, and have their say uh, before any changes to standards are brought forward. So using your earlier line of argument, you don't think that the affirmative procedure would be a deterrent on ministers abusing the process? Uh, ministers are always in line with the law, so, so need no deterrent to, to prevent them from, from um, taking, taking wrong action. As I say, common sense here means that actually it, it, we will be looking for alignment with other parts of the UK, with, with the international community. So while there is a broad power, the room for manoeuvre is, is much more much more limited than that. You know, if you're going to use legislation to create an offence, that should be subject to a greater level of parliamentary scrutiny than the negative procedure. Potentially, but if we look at the, the example so cite, yes. cited in the letter, uh, 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 it, it's, a, it's a potentially leading, leading towards a no. <laughs> the examples cited in our letter, uh, all made under the European Communities Act uh, 1972, all creating offences with the, the level five fine, all made under negative procedure. So existing practice has been to use negative procedure in relation to marketing standards regulations. Well, that doesn't mean existing practice is right, and that's what we're here to scrutinise, of course. It, 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 it does. Um, Obviously, the 1972 Act provides a, um, an op a choice of procedure, an affirmative procedure can be followed. I'm certainly not aware of any example uh, of any of the marketing standards made since devolution where there has been any suggestion from parliamentary committees that the affirmative should have been followed rather than, rather than negative. Okay. Um, any other members have questions? Okay, um, I think that's our questions for today. A slightly easier session, or shorter anyway, uh, than uh, last week. Um, so can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, and his officials uh, for attending. And we'll have a short break while you leave. Thank you. Agenda item three, we're considering an instrument subject to the affirmative procedure, the Draft Fuel Poverty Enhanced Heating Scotland Regulations 2020. These regulations set out three enhanced heating regimes and specify the types of household that will have an enhanced heating regime applied to it for the purposes of measuring fuel poverty. In regulation two of the instrument, the defined term benefits ought to have referred to 
benefits received for a care need or disability to mirror the definitions of the 2019 Act. So does the committee therefore wish to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting ground? Okay. And does the committee wish to welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to amend the instrument by correction slip? Thank you. Agenda uh, item four is to consider instruments that are subject to negative procedure. Uh, we've got the local government pension scheme, increased pension entitle entitlement, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland regulations, 2019 SSI, 2019 438. These regulations ensure continuity of an affected member's pension at its current rate where incorrect guaranteed mi minimum pension data has been applied to the annual indexation of that pension. Regulation 1-2 of the instrument provides that the regulations have effect from the 8th of April 2019, subject to the exceptions in paragraph 3. However, exceptions are also specified in paragraph 4. Regulation 1-2 um, should therefore refer to the exceptions in both paragraphs 3 and 4, and not just paragraph 3. So does the uh, committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of Parliament under the general reporting ground? Thank you. And does the committee wish to welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to correct this by amending instrument? Thank you. No points have been raised on SSI's 2020, 3, 6 and 7. So is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you very much, and I'll move the meeting into private.